When they invited me to this event, I felt very honored, but also quite puzzled by the theme they had chosen, the power of one. Any entrepreneur will tell you that success is about teams, it's about networks, it's about luck, but not about the power of one. The power of one is something we talk about post-mortem in funerals. <laughs> and I have no intention to get there yet. So, you know, what was I going to talk about? And one of the most common misconceptions about the power of one is that success in entrepreneurs is all about vision. Successful entrepreneurs see visions the others don't, right? I believe nothing could be farther from the truth. And actually, when a young entrepreneur comes to see me for advice and tells me he has a vision, I tell him, please consult an ophthalmologist. <laughs> and if the system persists, maybe a psychiatrist could actually help. But more seriously, visions are like opinions. Everybody's got one. And it's obvious that it's easier to be successful if you see the right wave coming. But seeing the right wave does not make you a great surfer. That only happens to Keanu Reeves in Point Break, but that's Hollywood. <laughs> okay, in real life, seeing where the future may take you doesn't get you there. It's not the vision, it's the design. It's about designing the products, the technologies, the services, which will allow you to capture the value of changes in your environment. And let's face it, although you may think your vision is unique, there are hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people out there seeing the same wave as you are. But only a few will be focused enough and define the right vision, the, sorry, make the right design in order to be able to be successful. See, there's a lot of confusion about vision. <laughs> Let me share with you a few examples from my experience. The first one is PhotoWire, in which I was involved as a business angel and a friend. This company was started by uh, Alan Tavel Krimerman and Patrick Serex back in 1996. And Alan and Patrick were amongst the first people to see that the traditional film photography was going to be replaced by digital cameras. And this may seem obvious to you today in 2013, but back in 1996, there were only a few cameras out on the market with very poor resolution. That was a very bold statement, and they decided to act on it. They were experienced entrepreneurs, and they built around them an all-star team. And they were able to get the attention of the giants of the industry, the Agfas and the Kodaks. But PhotoWire was initially designed to try to help those soon-to-be-extinct dinosaurs to make the transition from the analogic world to the digital world. In fact, PhotoWire made the perfect services, technologies, products to help them migrate their huge customer base from analog to digital. What the design didn't really anticipate is that those companies would not embrace change. They would actually resist it. They would actually oppose it. And that's one of the reasons why many of those companies actually disappeared. And others saw 90% of their stock value evaporate. But that, of course, didn't help much for PhotoWire. Great entrepreneurs find a way through, and they did. They redesigned PhotoWire services into a more decentralized way, went through mergers and acquisitions, and eventually the company was successful and sold to HP back in 2006. But my point is, even when you're the first ones to see a wave, your experience and determined, it's not the vision that made it successful. It was finding the right design. Let me share with you another example. The parallel between WebVan and Le Shop. I was one of the founders of Le Shop. Any Le Shop customers in the room today? I was expecting more noise from such a great <laughs> service. Come on. But at least I can ask the question. You know, you cannot ask whether there's any WebVan customers in the room because WebVan went bust after raising more than a billion dollars. And what's fascinating about it is that both companies were created by teams in the mid-90s that had exactly the same vision. And I'm not talking about the overall industry trends. I'm talking down to the details of what would make the business successful. Customer metrics, customer demographics, the importance of the customer service, etc. But there was a fundamental difference in design. WebVan decided to go and build what was called at the time the last mile of the internet. This massive infrastructure, a concept that was invented by some investment bankers that thought that if you made an infrastructure massive enough, nobody could go around you, so you would have a national monopoly. A little bit like the telcos had with the copper wires. And of course, what didn't work for the telcos with the copper wires didn't work in the internet world either. 
And when the money stopped flowing freely into the internet world, delivery costs were way too expensive and the company went bust. Now, I'm not, have, I don't have the time to go into details about the Le Shop design and the Le Shop story, which you, most of you know being here in Switzerland as a, as a great success example. But the key difference in design was to refuse this idea of the first model of the internet. We knew that if we wanted to go for the right customer demographics, which is working families with kids, it was going to be slow to build up sales. Very simply, because in the mid-90s, there were not many of those connected. So we sought out and found a partner with the Swiss Post, and that was tremendous for both parties. The Swiss Post took a bet that we were going to be successful, but they created one of their major customers today. And for us, it allows us to concentrate on the business and thus be able to beat Migros and Coop, which are the major Swiss retailers on the internet space, and ultimately be successful and to be able to sell it to Migro in 2006. But what's fascinating about this is that we, Webvan and us, had really very similar ways to look forward. We had the same vision. We could have exchanged our vision statements. So see, it's not about vision, it's about design. It's design that makes success. It's not the vision. The last example I'd like to share with you is my latest venture, Eclosion. Eclosion's mission is to take discoveries from the medical field and to convert them into life-altering drugs. We have a process that goes virtually from the academic lab all the way through clinical trials. Now, eclosion goes against the most common vision of investors in the biotech field, which is that to invest in early-stage biotech cannot be profitable, that it's toxic. And it's a paradox, because we live at a time where we have a phenomenal amount of new discoveries in medicine. But the problem is, discoveries don't cure people. You need drugs that build on these discoveries to be able to cure people. And developing drugs is actually a very difficult business. It takes a lot of time, 10 to 12 years, a lot of money in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's very risky because very few compounds make it to the market. And actually, there's very few things you can do to change those parameters because you have to understand the number one law of biology, which is you cannot make a baby in one month with nine women. <laughs> so why would anybody go into such a business? Well, there may be easier and faster ways than biotech to make money, but there's also very few fields where can have such a tremendous impact on the life of people. But in order to be successful, we had to come up with a radically new design. And I made a bold hypothesis, which was 10 years ago. If you put around the table the state, academia, pharma companies, and private investors, and you would manage to have them all work together, then you could actually have an impact on those key parameters. Because if you use their collective intelligence, you can at least optimize timelines, still respecting the one baby rule. Then you could also tremendously diminished costs if you're able to use existing infrastructure, both public and private. And if you can't really diminish risk, at least you could find a way to share it between the parties so that it became balanced and acceptable to all parties. And that's what we did. First, we created a space, called like an incubator for lack of a better word, which is state-sponsored, but also supported by academia and industry where any researcher can come in with his discovery, and he will find the industry professionals that will help him make the experiments to see whether his discovery can have or not a life-altering life application on patients. And on the other side, we created a private investment fund that not only can invest a little bit of money at the beginning of those companies, but can continue investing in them all the way through clinical trials, and thus, serve as the key financial partner to attract over other investors. We started, uh, we started Eclosion back in 2004 now, uh, with Benoit Dubuis, who was at the time the Dean of the School of Life Sciences of EPFL, and we were joined by Christophe Guichard to bring us tremendous financial intelligence. And we started incubating projects. We created our first companies back in 2006, and today I'm tremendously proud to say that you know, we have created some of the most exciting biotech companies in this field. We have several companies in clinical trials with 
completely novel drugs, first in class, going after huge unmet medical needs. You can see those companies on our website, but for example, Genuro has started injecting patients in multiple sclerosis with an antibody which we hope can stop the disease. And two weeks ago, we created another new company in the field of cancer based on completely new science, a new way to approach this disease, because what we need is not only better drugs, it's also new ways to try to beat those beasts. Having all those partners work together was not exactly a walk in the park, because you can imagine that they all came to the table with quite different ideas of what success was. For the state, it was creating jobs, for academia, projection of the science on the city, for the pharma to have scouting opportunities, and for investors to make money, naturally. But in fact, in our design, we gave them one common overriding goal that would make everybody happy, which is to build successful companies. Because if you build successful biotech companies, you create jobs, you are projecting science to the city, you are creating new drug development opportunities, and you are creating a tremendous financial return. So thanks to design and being able to put all these people together, we actually are able to beat the odds of common vision that early stage biotech is just a toxic waste. So my takeaway message today to you is, it's not about vision, it's about design. You have to find the right design to encourage the right team to, read, to build the right business to have a great impact. And having a great impact through design is, for me, the most important power of one. Thank you. Thank you.